this is going to be the presentation on the public service loan forgiveness and we're just going to give you guys a breakdown of what the program consists of and some recent changes to it. So we're going to go ahead and get started. It should only take us about 30 minutes to get through this. And if you guys have any questions, please send them to Hannah through the um, Q&A. So some of the things we're going to be talking about is the history of public service loan forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness requirements, uh, what is a qualifying loan, what is a qualifying employer, what is considered full-time employment, what is a qualifying repayment plan, and what is a qualifying monthly payment. We're also going to talk about how to keep track of public service loan forgiveness eligibility, uh, public service loan forgiveness in the news, and then the future of public service loan forgiveness. First, it's the history of public service loan forgiveness. So this program was started um, back in 2007 under the College Cost Reduction and Access Act of 2007. Um, all borrowers that met all of the requirements would have not been eligible for public service loan forgiveness until October 2017 at the earliest, because that would have been 10 years later. Um, the program was designed to forgive the remainder balance of your federal direct loans tax-free after meeting all of the eligibility requirements and submitting all of the required paperwork. So basically now, um, you know, we're more than 10 years into the program and um, it's still, you know, fully, and nothing has changed with the program from the way that it was designed from the beginning so far. So everything has still stayed the same. Public service loan forgiveness requirements. So it does have a couple of requirements. Um, the first one going from the bottom up is to have a qualifying employer. Um, that is probably like one of the biggest. Um, you do have to be working for that employer full time, which is the second uh, requirement. And then the third requirement is having qualifying loans, which we will get more into detail on, and being in a qualifying repayment plan, which usually is one of the income driven repayment plans. And then lastly, you have to make 120 qualifying monthly payments over a period of 10 years. So there is no way to get public service loan forgiveness um, any sooner than 10 years. 10 years is the minimum amount that you need to be able to get public service loan forgiveness. So what is a qualifying loan? Um, the qualifying loans are listed up at the top. Um, all of your qualifying loans will have the word direct in front of it. So it would be either a direct subsidized loan, a direct unsubsidized loan, a direct plus loan that could be either for parents or graduate or professional students or a direct consolidated loan. Um, if you have some of these other loans that are in blue, like the FELL loan um, or the Perkins loan or the Health Profession Student Loan, HPSL, those loans have to be consolidated in order to become eligible for public service loan forgiveness. So if you have those and you just don't do anything with them, then you will just need to pay those loans off because they won't be eligible for the public service loan forgiveness program. But you can easily consolidate um, at the end of after you graduate to make those loans eligible if it's in your best interest to do so. You can always find the types of federal loans that you have by logging into studentaid.gov and reviewing um, the different loan types that you have. What is a qualifying employer? So a qualifying employer would be a government organization that is federal, state, local, or tribal. Um, the second is a non-for-profit tax-exempt organization under Section 501c3 of the IRS. Um, and then really, for the most part, those are the two main um, um, sources of employment that would um, make you eligible for PSLF. The last one, which is just a non-for-profit organization that is not a labor union or partisan political organization, there really hasn't been anyone that has fallen under that category. You can see that from the most recent report, 73% of um, employers, uh, um, you know, borrowers that are pursuing the program are working at a government organization and 27% are working for some type of 501c3 tax exempt organization. Um, and then just so you know too, um, I wanna make sure I read this. An employee is someone who is hired and paid by the employer. If you're working at a location under a contract with your employer, the organization that hired and pays you must be the qualifying employer, not the organization where you perform the work. So basically the company organization that pays you is the one that has to be the 501c3 because sometimes there is these times when you might perform the work at a 501c3 building, but the organization that is paying you might be for profit. And in that case, you wouldn't qualify for PSLF. 
not with that employer at least. You can find another employer and then begin making qualifying payments, but um, it has to be the organization that actually pays your salary, the one that is the nonprofit organization, 501c3, or the government organization. What is considered full-time employment? Um, so you have to meet your employer's definition of full-time. So if your employer says it's 37.5 hours, then you have to meet their definition of full-time. If they don't have um, a definition for full-time for public service loan forgiveness purposes, it has to be at least an annual average of 30 hours per week. And if you are employed at more than one qualifying part-time job at the same time, you may meet the full-time requirement if you work a combined average of at least 30 hours per week with your employers. So you could work like, you know, 15 hours at one, 15 hours at another, um, as long as you average out that 30 hours per week with both of your jobs. And then vacation or leave time provided by the employer or taken or leave taken for a condition that is qualified, qualifying reason for leave under the Family Medical Leave Act of 1993, like, um, like if you are on maternity leave or something like that, that would be equivalent to hours worked in qualifying employment. So that wouldn't count against you, just so you know that. What is a qualifying repayment plan? So there is um, four income-driven repayment plans, revised pay-as-you-earn, pay-as-you-earn, income-based repayment, and income-contingent repayment. All of those four are eligible repayment plans for public service loan forgiveness. The 10-year standard repayment plan is also eligible for public service loan forgiveness, but you wouldn't want to choose that last option because your loans would be paid off in 10 years and there wouldn't be anything left to forgive because that's just the way that the 10-year standard repayment plan is, is designed to work. So you always want to try to choose one of the income-driven repayment plans. Most typically, if you're going for public service loan forgiveness, you're going to want to try to go with either revised pay-as-you-earn or pay-as-you-earn because those are 10% of your discretionary income, as opposed to um, IBR, which bumps up to 15%, and then ICR, which bumps up to 20%. So you obviously wanna try to choose the one that you would have to pay the least amount on so that you can get the most forgiveness. So usually those would be the first two um, repayment plans that are listed here, repay or pay. What is a qualifying monthly payment? So a qualifying monthly payment has to be made on time, which is within 15 days of the due date. It also has to be a full monthly payment. So um, you can't be short by like five cents or, or whatnot. It has to be for the exact amount that is due every month. Um, if you do end up having a $0 payment as, as your required payment, that would count as a full monthly payment. And then um, it also has to be made while you're employed full time by a qualifying employer. So also important to note that neither the 120 qualifying payments nor the employment have to be consecutive. So if you do find like a qualifying employer and you work there for three years and then you're not able to find another one right after that, you can kind of take a break from PSLF and then come back into it once you find a qualifying employer again. But the forgiveness is just going to take longer for you to obtain because of those years that you worked at a non-qualifying employer. Um, also, voluntary payments made during your grace period don't count towards public service loan forgiveness. You actually have to wait until you go into repayment, which is typically six months after you graduate because that's how long your six, that's how long your grace period is, is six months. Um, and one of the recent changes to the, to the rules is that now lump sum payments and prepayments um, qualify towards um, your total number of payments. So now you can make future payments or prepayments to your qualifying federal student loans and they all be counted towards your PSLF qualifying payment count if all other program criteria are met. So prepayments will count for up to 12 months or the next time you're due to recertify for your income-driven repayment plan, whichever is sooner. So say for example, you had um, to, you knew that your payment was $100 every month and you um, paid $1,200 at the beginning of January, then that should cover you for the full next 12 months because they would take that 1,200 and divide it over the next 12 months so that you would have qualifying payments for that year. But um, if you have more questions about this, you can also contact your loan servicer, but this is just a recent change that came about in the last couple months where before 
you were not able to do this. Um, the payments had to be time made at the time that they were required and there was no like lump sum payments or prepayments that could qualify. Um, basically, if you made one big payment, that was only gonna count as one payment and now it can be broken up into uh, the next 12 months. So the CARES Act and public service loan forgiveness. Um, as you guys know, the CARES Act is still going on with um, giving you 0% interest and no payments that are required for students that are in repayment. Um, another benefit is that uh, people that are in this situation right now, those suspended payments would count towards public service loan forgiveness. And then just so you guys know, this CARES Act thing started as of when the pandemic was announced, so March 13, 2020. And it's official until January 31st, 2021. But we did receive um, news that President-elect or now president maybe, 12 o'clock, um, is gonna be hopefully extending that until I believe September of this year for the 0% interest and the no payments required, which will also um, extend this uh, suspended payments that will count towards public service loan forgiveness. You guys don't really have to worry about this if you guys are currently students because you're not in repayment. So this doesn't really apply to you, but it's just kind of good to know. You can always go to the bottom link on the bottom to kind of look at those official announcements that are made by studentaid.gov to kind of see what's going on with that. And once they officially make that announcement of that extension, um, that will be updated on that link as well. So how to keep track of public service loan forgiveness eligibility. Um, this is the public service loan forgiveness certification and application form. And um, this form was recently updated in November and they basically just made it a little bit easier because before there was like three different forms that you need to that you needed to submit depending on the situation for public service loan forgiveness. If you were just trying to kind of get a status of where you were at in the process and how many qualifying payments, that was one form. If you were trying to actually get forgiveness after making 120 payments after 10 years, that was a different form. And if you were trying to go through the um, temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness that Congress approved a few years ago for some students that were making um, payments that might have not counted, but they were, it was just like a certain like tricky um, group that could be approved. It was a different form. So it was three different forms that you would that you could potentially be filling out for basically the same result. So now they just combine all of those three into one form just to make it easier. And this is the new form, it's available. Um, it's not gonna expire until 2023. So it's gonna be good for a while. Um, the form itself has to be completed by you and your employer. Um, and it has to be submitted either by mail, fax, or um, or you can upload it directly if you have Fed Loan Servicing as your loan servicer. Fed Loan Servicing is one of the loan servicers that handles public service loan forgiveness, and it's the only one that handles that program. So if you are planning on doing PSLF, uh, once you submit your form and everything gets you know looked at and they see that you are on the right track, you will be switched over to Fed Loan Servicing if you currently have a different loan servicer. Um, it's a very good idea to periodically submit the form um, to make sure that you're on track, to make sure that your number of qualifying payments that you have matches what Fed Loan Servicing is saying that you have. And then it's very important that you submit it at least once a year, um, but at the very minimum for every different employer that you have so that when you get to the forgiveness, you're not trying to go back like you know seven years trying to get forms for time that you worked and it's just gonna make the process like a lot more quicker for you. Um, that is the phone number right there in yellow for the Fed Loan Servicing Public Service Loan Forgiveness line. So you can always call that number if you have any questions as well. And then in order to actually get the certification and application form, you do need to go to studentaid.gov, um, click on manage loans, click on public service loan forgiveness and then you will see the form. It's called Public Service Loan Forgiveness PSLF and Temporary Expanded PSLF Certification and Application. So the, the name of the form itself got a lot longer, but it's better, like I said, because they combined the three forms into one. So now it's less of, it's less confusing for borrowers which form they're supposed to complete. There's only one now, basically. So public service loan forgiveness in the news. Um, some of the reasons why um, there had 
has been a lot of denials in the program is because, like I said earlier, the program started in 2007, but before July 1st, 2010, most of the available federal loans that were made were FELL loans, and those loans don't qualify for public service loan forgiveness unless they are consolidated into a direct consolidated loan. A lot of borrowers did not know that, so a lot of borrowers thought that they were doing everything that they needed to do, and it turns out they had the wrong kind of loans to qualify for the program. So um, that was one of the problems with the program from the beginning. The second is that when public service loan forgiveness began on October 2007, there was actually only one qualifying income driven repayment plan. At that time, it was income contingent repayment, which is 20% of your discretionary income. Other income driven repayment plans were introduced later. Um, IBR was introduced in 2009, pay as you earn was introduced in 2012, and then revised pay as you earn was introduced in 2015. So really the best repayment plans haven't been, weren't available from the beginning. They've only been available, you know, pay as you earn and revised pay as you earn for the last, you know, eight or nine years. Um, and then the final reason is that the public service loan forgiveness certification form um, an application that you currently submit that I just showed you guys to kind of make sure that you're on the right track did not become available until January 2012, which is more than four years after the public service loan forgiveness program began. So the program began and there was really no official form to kind of keep track on making sure that you were doing the right thing. So that didn't start until 2012, which is a couple of years later. And that just kind of threw things off as well. But there is good news. Um, some of the reasons for the denials, just so you guys can kind of see, and this is as of November 2020, is 59% was due to qualifying payments. So 59% of people that submitted for forgiveness do not have 120 qualifying payments made. 23% were missing information, so they could potentially still get forgiveness. They just need to make sure that all the information that is being requested is being completed correctly. 14% um, had ineligible loans. Again, they probably had FELL loans, Perkins loans, or HPSL loans. And then 4% was just miscellaneous. But the good news is, I think it's on this slide right here. These are the amounts of public service loan forgiveness discharged amounts since December 2019 to November 2020. So you can see that in December 2019, um, the amount that had been discharged is 99184000 dollars 903, and that has now grown to 290,395,836. These discharged amounts have grown by 192% in less than one year because we still don't have the amounts for December 2020, but that just shows you that like the amounts that are being discharged are actually, they actually are happening and the program does work. You just need to make sure that you're doing everything that you need to do to actually get your loans forgiven if you are going to pursue the program. Um, so the future of public service loan forgiveness, I think we're getting close to being done and then we're gonna take your questions. Um, so right now, um, there could be changes to public service loan forgiveness in the future under a Biden administration. However, currently none of the proposals include elimination of the program. Um, if we have more information, you know, we'll always keep you guys updated. Like I said, I don't think the program is going to be, um, taken away, but if there was some type of change to happen, most likely what would happen is that borrowers who it's already been promised to would likely be grandfathered in and it would only affect new borrowers on or after the date that that change takes place, which typically is always July 1st of um, of, a, of a particular year. So also very important to know that public service loan forgiveness is listed on your master promissory note for your federal direct loans. So if you look at your master promissory note and you actually read through it, you will see that um, it is in section, I think 22, uh, which talks about discharge and how to have your loans forgiven. It is, it is talked about on there and it kind of specifies like, you know, if you do this, 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 and this, then you can get your loans forgiven, which is really important because your master promissory note is like the legal binding agreement between you and the Department of Education. And I think that is it. So 